So, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to have you here in Santiago with us to, to, to have a conversation about territories, about food, about architecture, about urbanism. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Joan, muchas gracias por estar aquí con Joan, thank you very much for being here. And uh, we'd like to thank the organizers of uh, such a top event. Thank you for allowing us to be able to discuss and reflect uh, from this corner of the Atlantic. For many, it's the center of our own world. I don't see it as a periphery, but I see it as the center. And uh, we have top speakers. And uh, we just heard some of the best speakers uh, as we did this morning. So we're going to start uh, this discussion. And uh, we'd like to speak about what is happening at Glasgow these days, with the Conference of Parties number 26 in Glasgow. And what we saw is some answers that are doubtful not too brave uh, to face climate change. So the discussion today, or rather this conversation between Joan and Carolyn, should have a threading line. We should speak about uh, land, uh, territories, biodiversity, from the vision of architecture and city planning. The threading line should be climate change. I'd like to introduce Caroline and Joan. Caroline is an architect from the Cambridge University. She was also the director of the London School of Economics in the Division of Cities. Since the year 2000, she has been researching into the relationship between food and cities. Achilles is uh, the author of an excellent uh, work, Hungry Cities, how some territories are depleted to provide food to these big cities and how they are left behind. And uh, food is a potential element uh, to trigger changes in the 21st century and to reverse uh, some process of uh, environmental deterioration. For example, in the TED Talk, of Oxford, for example, she has had like one million visits or hits because this shows that there are more people that are more and more concerned about this issue. So this leads us to optimism too. So thank you very much, Caroline, again. John is an excellent architect. What can I say about Joan and also his partner, Rick Baje? He has. Uh, an office in Catalonia, and they have developed many projects of construction, but uh, especially they have worked in many geographical areas trying uh, to converge uh, rural and urban realities, trying to rechannel process of degradation in the territories. They have a, a project uh, of the dump of San Juan, and uh, to me, John, allow me to say that this is the biggest project globally about what you should do about how to recover and to heal the wounds that uh, have been inflicted upon the territory. And John has uh, many awards, such as the gold medal of uh, the Higher Council of the Schools of Architecture of Spain or the Mediterranean Prize to the Landscape in the year 2007, or the EU Award for Public Spaces. Mm, well, we have two great thinkers here, the great thinkers that go beyond and they do not stay just observing the aesthetic object. As architects, sometimes we stay there for too long and we do not raise our eyes to see what is happening in the world and we don't take into account the changes that are needed. And uh, so from our profession, we can do something to 
carry that out. So we're going to start. And um, in this dialogue, I'd like to focus on some concepts that sometimes crisscross or um, confuse us. We should continue to speak about territories as a synonym of a physical land uh, specific, or should we speak about uh, geographical spaces or a single territory, the world, given the connection between them? This is a quote by the prestigious Brazilian geographer Rogerio Harfest. We should speak more about concepts that show multiplicity, the potential links that express the complexity of the matters, uh, the territory, the lack of territory, or speaking about a new territorialism. This is the first question to start this discussion to speak about territories, to define these concepts. And maybe we should speak about, we should not speak about territories anymore. Maybe we should speak about just one territory, the world. English to catch up with you or um, Spanish. Um, thank you very much. Yes, I, 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 what I often talk about is the fact that we are entering a neo-geographical age. So in fact, in the last panel, we heard people mm -hmm, yes. talking about the fact that um, you know, we've reached a point where we can't sort of just assume that nature is infinite and we can just live our lives by throwing things away and it's all going to be fine. And we, we are confronting this new reality. Um, and I think for the last 200 years or so, we've been ignoring geography, you know, because basically with the Industrial Revolution, we had for the first time the wherewithal to you know, live anywhere effectively. To, I mean, my specific thing, as you said in your kind introduction, is about how cities have been fed through history and what it takes to feed a city. And, you know, before the Industrial Revolution, basically, the only way you could have a really big city was either to have um, an empire, <laughs> you know, like, like Peking or, you know, Beijing now, and, and literally, you know, thousands, if not millions of slaves kind of bringing the food physically in, or, as in the case of Rome, to have access to the sea, because the whole question was how you not only <coughs> grew enough food to feed the city, but how you moved it around. So when the railways came, uh, this changed everything, because it obliterated geography, effectively. Um, and this is when we really see, and I, I don't know how long you've got, but you, know, you see the expansion not only of cities, but also of their productive hinterlands. Um, so, for example, you know, the American Great West, which had been a grassland inhabited by an estimated 60 million bison and lots of Native American tribes, uh, was transformed in the space of a decade into, you know, the first monocultural grain field the world had ever seen. Mm -hmm. um, and so this, this is the beginning of the invention of cheap food, this, this complete illusion yes. that we can go on to talk about later. Um, but also, you know, the idea that you can just move, use railways to move the grain around, feed it to cows, which is a really bad idea. We can talk about that as well, maybe. Um, but it commodifies the land, effectively. What industrialization did is it commodified the land. You know, it turned territories into these uniform, mm -hmm. monocultural, food-producing regions. Um, and people were living increasingly in cities. So in a sense, they didn't really see this reality. Most people did not with witness this reality. Um, Obviously, mostly the people who were unfortunately um, either killed or got rid of off this <laughs> land. Um, you know, so I think you know, the, the last 200 years have been the period when we've really seen this kind of colonization of territories. Um, my sound sounds incredibly loud all of a sudden. Anyway, um, and maybe I'll just take that off. Um, that's the thing to do. Um, the, you know, the colonization of territories for a purpose. Again, in the previous panel, people were talking about you know, the new economy, you know, and the fact that the economy is predicated on treating nature as if it comes for free, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, these are all enormous connected issues. Um, and for me, food is just a beautiful lens for sort of seeing how they're all joined together, because basically we all have to eat, so we're all kind of complicit in this uh, way of feeding ourselves, which we now discover is completely unsustainable, is destroying the planet. I mean, you mentioned climate change. I mean, I think... Again, the previous panel made the very important point that, you know, lack of biodiversity is arguably as, in, as it's going to kill us earlier than climate change. And of course, they're related anyway. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, just, just treating nature as this kind of uh, canvas on which to sort of paint the external analysis of our life is a thing that we now have to reverse. And 
something I would like to say, because I want to come on to talk about it if possible, is um, that what I think is we need is a, a new idea of a good life, because I think the good life that we've inherited is a very really 19th and 20th century idea of a good life. And I think there's a, there's a core of the problem in that. Okay. So, Joan? Bueno, yo no soy un teórico. Well, I'm not a theoretical person, so what I can say are insights uh, after a long practice. Very often my work is more connected. I don't know if you remember that uh, film, that Tarantino's film, in which uh, there was a character that was called Mr. Wolf, and when there was a, a bloody crime, he'd get there and uh, he would uh, sweep the, everything and clean up, and he would take care of the course. And uh, so the landscape managers are like the Mr. Wolf or the social democracy, because we are somebody that uh, comes here to solve problems that were previously created. So I have worked for many times solving issues, and then you begin to understand what the actions of your predecessors should have been, so you wouldn't be necessary. So basically, this is connected with what you said, the concept of the territory. So if you check what territory is on a dictionary, territory is a land that is a property of somebody. And the dictionary states very clearly that the owner is forced to maintain that territory. This is something we forgot. We believe that territory doesn't belong to anyone. Therefore, we dispose of our garbage or the rivers or the affluents, the tributaries. Uh, we, we cover them. And no, the owner and very often the owners are not private, usually they are public because uh, private owners are, are demanded more by law, but uh, the public owner apparently has passed the law and uh, didn't have to follow that and they just uh, devastated the, the territory and this cannot happen anymore because the territory is the ally of the city. In the previous panel, uh, the person who was sitting here, Salvador, said that those millions of people that are going to migrate, where will they go? Well, we all know they will go to the city. They will not go to Teruel. They will go to Madrid, Barcelona, to Zaragoza. They will go to cities. And those cities that will grow will have to be well connected with the territory. And so we have to merge the spirit of each one. On the one hand, the territory basically is the nature. It is a natural space. Therefore, we have to merge the nature with the values of the cities. City versus the countryside is the place of freedom. And uh, the people who live in the city versus those who live in the countryside enjoy some freedom. And uh, the countryside is too connected with the natural elements and the crops. So you are like damned for living in the countryside very often. So we have to really think about that before we criticize it. Ashton Kung heard has uh, mentioned in his exhibition about the countryside. So we, we have to merge the city of the free man with uh, the countryside and the nature. I think it's the basis of our work. And I think it's the only theory I have uh, structured after my years of working. If we don't understand that the basis of our work is to transform cities into denaturalize, renaturalize uh, spaces with better air, uh, with uh, better vegetation, better water, with a uh, conception of uh, biophilia, as that man mentioned. I think that biophilia in the cities is extremely important. Otherwise, we will be doing poorly. And actually, this is how we are doing now. Well, you have talked about uh, the, the core of the discussion. The city versus the, the countryside, this is something that is still existing. City 
has always been conceived as a space for the creation of ideas, a civilized space, and the countryside was just the supplier. It is like a relationship between the prey and the predator. And uh, so I'm going to speak about uh, the book Hungry Cities and Caroline talks about an old English song from the 17th century, which is called The Poor Man Pays for All. And it says something like, The person pays for all. The lawyer pays for all. The poor man pays for all and feed for all. Mm -hmm. Es decir, so the people from the countryside have been the eternal supplier of food, the exploited part, the colonized part, but uh, because we need food, we need energy, the big cities need energy and food. So this is the second question that I have for you. Along the lines of this old uh, English popular song, the paradigm of the 21st century for city planning and architecture is to break up this limit between the urban and the rural, between the city and the countryside. They should not uh, turn their backs to, to each other and they should meet mutually. And uh, the city should understand the damage they make. And I believe that many issues generated by climate change uh, for the predation of the territories is connected with this concept. Uh, the city has turned its back on the countryside. So this is my question for you. Is it necessary a new paradigm for city planning to merge these two realities? Uh, um, Basically, I mean, what, what, what you're raising is something I'm very interested in. In fact, weirdly, I've just written another book, which is not yet translated in <laughs> Spanish, but it's called Citopia. And I should explain, Citopia is just, it just means food place. Uh, and it comes from the Greek word, citos, <coughs> for food, and topos, for place. Because I believe we live in a world shaped by food. And if you look historically, I mean, basically the question of how to eat is absolutely fundamental to the way we've evolved, of course, and all living creatures have to answer this question, you know, how are we going to nourish ourselves? They don't necessarily do it consciously, of course. Um, but as we have progressed through history trying to answer this question, it's had a profound effect on the way we live. So, for example, most of our ancestors, as we know, were hunter-gatherers. You know, so when you're a hunter-gatherer, you, um, by the way, I am answering your question, it's just I'm going a long way back to do it. Um, you know, you follow the food around, basically. You know, you pull berries off trees, you sort of hunt in a region, and then you move around. So you're following the food around a territory. When we started farming, you know, around about 12,000 years ago, um, we immediately created effectively a divided territory because there's the productive bit, which we call loosely countryside, and there's the bit in the middle where everyone gathers to socialize, which is not entirely non-productive, but essentially non-productive. And I call it the, the fried egg model of urbanity because it's like the, the urban bit is the yolk and the, the white bit, the countryside, is around it. So all our early cities had roughly this kind of model. Um, actually, there's a new book out which is saying there's other kind of models are available. But, you know, essentially this was the predominant model. And what's interesting about this, this city-state model, which is city plus countryside together, is it expresses a sort of inherent duality that we have in us as humans as soon as we start living in cities, which is that... Um, I often use Aristotle's term. Uh, Aristotle called us political animals, which is a term that I love, because on the one hand, the fact that we're political means that we have to gather together, and we, you know, we are you know, group beasts, we're social animals, if you like. Uh, and of course, living in the polis was how you were political. But on the other hand, we're animals. What does this mean? It means that we need nature. So how do we bring these two things together? Um, and the Greeks were very obsessed with this, and both Plato and Aristotle, for example, you know, they asked the question of how would you ideal, what does an ideal city look like, basically? 
And the conclusion they came to was a city that could feed itself. You know, a self-sufficient city was ideal because then it could be politically independent. And the ideal arrangement they came up with was they called it oikonomia. And this is very interesting because, of course, oikonomia, if the word sounds familiar, it's because it actually forms the basis of our modern word economics. Um, was that every citizen would have a house in the city and a farm in the countryside, yes. and the farm would feed the house. So this is good oikonomia. <laughs> and if every citizen has this, then the city is self-sufficient. And it's a really interesting model, because it goes to the core of, if you like, a good economy that has a natural balance. And Aristotle was obsessed with balance, as you probably know. So the ideal human is also a very balanced human. Um, so it's, it's about bringing balance between the city and the countryside. And, of course, the irony is that Aristotle warned against uh, this other thing called crematistike, which is the making of money for its own sake, because he said this could never have a natural balance. You know, so I call this phenomenon the urban paradox. And the urban paradox is that as, you know, we move into cities, as John was just saying, you know, more and more people, we, we, we get further and further away from this other essential part of our lives, which is nature. You know, and our need, not only for nature in order to feed us, but also to sustain us in other ways. I mean, there's all sorts of studies coming out now that we, you know, if you're surrounded by greenery, you recover much quicker from, you know, an operation and so on, that we actually respond directly to the natural world. And the paradox is there's no ideal answer to how you organize it, but absolutely, I am arguing for what I call, by the way, and I'm going to stop talking in a second, landscapes for human and non-human flourishing. This is what I think we need to be moving yes. towards. And it's, it's about bringing society and nature together somehow. And it can happen at any scale, and it can happen in any shape. But that's really where my head's at. I think that's where we need to be going. And as I say, if only that was a sort of a, a global model, because I don't think it is at all at the moment. But again, we can talk more about how we can maybe make it more. So the vision of a good life I'm talking about, by the way, also is about how we bring society and nature together, which I don't think is the predominant model of a good life that we have at the moment. Okay. Perfect. Okay. I'm very happy to share this I am very happy to share this panel with Caroline because um, we work in many projects that just uh, stick to the specific field of the inherent values of, of the land, uh, the, the, uh, the vegetation, and she adds another aspect, which is food. and. Uh, Paradoxically, it is really important. For example, yesterday we were talking, and where I used to live uh, in Barcelona, in a district, there were cows nearby, dairy cows. And we had rabbits and chicken in our house. And sometimes uh, mm, uh, one would go in the middle of Barcelona, and my grandfather would buy artichokes there. So this is something that really many people consider horrible. Many, many progressive friends of mine from the transition. And uh, you can have a, a dog and two cats, but you cannot have a chicken or a rabbit, because this seems to go against uh, the hygienic regulation. And, uh, and uh, the artichokes from El Prat are totally polluted today, and you cannot sell them if they don't comply with the regulations. So she, she has touched upon a, a key issue. We try to merge the city and the countryside, but we only deal with aspects connected with the landscape. And, well, they are crucial, of course, but in a way, mm, I think that if uh, that lady and I work together to work with the city, I think that it will have more value. That is why you are both here. 
ver, seguimos con, por el, con un orden así para, porque entraremos en el tema del diseño de las ciudades. And uh, well, now we are going to, to speak about the design of cities on the basis of food. Uh, one question for you, Joan. After this pandemic, after this sudden time we've had to experience, and in big cities people has had to shut down in private spaces without the possibility to enjoy nature. Do you think that people are returning to, to nature? In the 19th century, Turan, in his book, uh, proposed, uh, well, there were industrial cities full of smoke and chimneys, and he proposed uh, something about uh, living in the forests. So do you think that uh, people are following Turan, this romanticism about nature of the 19th century? Yes, there is, and I think it is a mistake. Because I think that uh, the pandemic, and I think that we've all experienced that at home, has proven that we don't actually have to leave the cities. It has revealed the flaws of cities to fix them. And the pandemic taught us that our living space is our home or the balcony, because outside everything was a disaster. But if we rethink the cities, so our environment is not just our house, but a district in which uh, we could have practically everything, I think we would understand that when emergency situations emerge, as it happened in the past, I am for districts. I am from Sanz, a district from Barcelona where you had everything. Sanz is uh, at the city center. Uh, it's like three kilometers away from the city center of Barcelona. And there was a subway that uh, connected Sanz with Barcelona. And there were two trams, 56 and 57. So I never went to Barcelona until I turned 12. I didn't need that. Uh, I had to go there because I had to go to a doctor that lived in the Ensante of Barcelona. So crossing mm, the, the Plaza de España of Barcelona, and then you get to, quote unquote, Barcelona, because historically there were burots there. It was like a customs office, and you had to pay a, a toll to get there. So in my district, I had everything. I had a school. There were factories, uh, in sands. There were parks, squares, everything. At that time, no, but right now, districts have nothing in Barcelona. There is like a supermarket. You have to go to La Illa to go to the supermarket. And uh, the shops of the districts are, are not supplied. And uh, now we have a system in which uh, when you buy groceries, you don't know where they come from because they taste nothing. So I think that the pandemic should have taught us to modify cities, not just going to the countryside, moving to the countryside. So we need to ruralize cities, maybe not just that. We have to reorganize cities. We have to add nature, obviously. But there are also proximity services. We need to add uh, workplaces of proximity. Because now in the cities, everything is so far away. You need to drive to go and work. Because in the districts, there are no workplaces anymore. Because if you have to go to the notary, you have to go to Paseo de Gracia. And there is a notary in, in your district. Yes, it is a matter of scale organization. We need to remodify the scale of the cities, not just moving to a mountain. Yes, and I don't know if you agree with me, but I think that there is a, an overabundance of gestures of bringing uh, the green to the cities, and there's a lack of deep thought. These are just gestures, so, so we need to rethink the cities. Yes, this is just a pose. Now people are talking about the city gardens, and I think this is so stupid. And we were talking about that. Um, I think it's better to build a garden with uh, roses, uh, etc., and enjoy that and not mm, to grow tomatoes because you're go going to have to use pesticides. And uh, you will get two uh, carrots, but they will be as big as my fingers. So, so I think it's a, a pose. 
It is just a pose. <laughs> and uh, and uh, well, uh, now we're going to discuss uh, the subject matter in which Carolyn is an expert. You have analyzed this relationship between food and the cities. And you talk about indus industrialization, about this artificial soil that has been built in the territories by means of chemical fertilizers, uh, products, uh, byproducts of oil. And here there are scientists. 50% of the atoms of nitrogen we have in our bodies are artificial. They come from those chemical fertilizers with nitrogens that saved uh, the humankind uh, from famine, but uh, well, they are out there. And in recent days, in the COP, in the, the COP conference in Glasgow, there are some shy agreements, as we say in Galicia. They have spoken about reducing methane by 30 percent, and. Uh, so this is uh, something that uh, maintains uh, the greenhouse gas effect. And methane is produced by the cattle, especially state extensive cattle raising. And Brazil is an example. And, and this generates a big deforestation. So uh, th this is a vicious cycle. So this artificial soil that is required to feed the cities and this is my question for Caroline. And the future of the world and the, for the inversion of the deterioration of that carbon footprint that we have inflicted upon the territory is only possible to, to do that by means of food. So this is my question. So how can we do it? What are the urgent measures, realistic measures, too, that you can implement from now? question to what we were talking about before, interestingly, because they are linked, of okay. course, and yes, food is a great yes, connector, oh, no. so yes, food yes, yes. always course, links everything. everything together. So <laughs> I'm very, very interested in this conversation. What industrialization has done is it's dehumanized life, it's to strip the human out of everything that we do. So basically, you know, I mean, Juan was telling me last night, you know, he goes to his local market and the lady there knows him very well and she says, oh, try the sardines today, they're very good. You know, this is kind of, it's life on a mi sort of microcosmic level. It has the same sort of structure as healthy soil. You know, a, a healthy society resembles healthy soil. It's living, it's, it's diverse, it's complex, it's, it's about all sorts of interactions going on all the time. Now, the thing you all talk, so, so, and, and basically, um, I mean, when you were talking, Joanne, I was just thinking, you know, the 15-minute city is, it's quite a sort of an idea that's gaining a lot of traction at the moment. For example, Anne Hidalgo is talking about it in Paris. What does this really mean? It means bringing back the life you know, the, the sort of small-scale filigree life that used to be what an urban neighborhood was about. And there's a direct analogy in the landscape. So basically, um, you know, this model, this paradigm of, you know, spraying chemicals on the ground. Uh, and by the way, I just have to say something. I'm very passionate about, the, I'm passionate about all of this, but it sounds like a cliche, but, you know, this, this thing of how are we going to feed the world? I have to object strongly to this formulation. Who is we? Who is the world? Does the world want us to feed it? And isn't feeding things you do to animals rather than humans? So it's just a complete wrong formulation and it sort of highlights for me part of the problem. The problem is a mindset problem. Yes. You know, the idea of, of growing this thing called cheap food, which by the way doesn't exist, and I also now have to say something else, which is that if you think of what food is, food consists of living things, that we kill so we can live. Okay, so how can this be cheap? Oh. Food is life. So these, this is why these things are all connected. 
what is a good life? This is the question we have to be asking. Okay, a good life is one where I can go out of my door, I can go to my market seller who knows me well, he says, buy the sardines today. But also if I live in the countryside, I can grow food as I would like to grow. I mean, there's a very interesting example, by the way, to my mind, one of the greatest books written in the 20th century, and a lot of the books that I find most inspiring now were written in the 1970s, by the way. I mean, you know, we've known this stuff for a long time. But E.F. Schumacher's Small is Beautiful, if you know this book. I mean, I don't know how much, I'm sure many people in the audience do. It's a brilliant book. But what he talks about is the fact that, you know, we basically think we've solved the problem of production, you know, because industrialization gives us this idea and you can just, you know, externalize the true cost of life. But he tells a story in that book about a farmer who was growing uh, industrial crops for sale to the city. And uh, he was sort of saying, well, aren't you worried about what it's doing to the land and everything? And the farmer said, yeah, I'm absolutely terrified. I don't want a farm like this, but nobody will pay me to farm the other way. And he says, by the way, I don't eat this stuff. I eat organic. I wouldn't go near this food. You know, so it just shows you, going back to my point about economy, the, the original meaning of economy or economia was actually about the relationship between us and territory, us, you know, the human and the landscape and how we can come to an accommodation between those two things. So the kind of industrial model you're talking about has no future, but there's a huge amount of incredibly powerful vested interests in pretending that it's the only way, quote unquote, we can feed the world. You know, do not trust people who talk in this language. You know, and what we need is the act, a, absolute opposite. We need to rehumanize, we need to revalue. Yeah. Put food at the center of our economy. Food is the most valuable thing in our lives that we have to work to produce. It is life itself. How can we be treating it as cheap? And if we put the true value back in food and we organize our lives around that and we try to build societies in which everybody eats well, then it gets pretty, pretty revolutionary, by the way, but also pretty interesting. It's putting back, you know, asking this question, what is a good life? What makes us happy? We saw under lockdown, it's simple things, actually. Yes. Contact to nature, having time, time, the great thing we never talk about, that industrialization also eradicates. Industrialization commodifies land, commodifies people, and eradicates time. That's, you know, an industrial capitalism, I should have said. Yes which indeed came up yesterday. So we need a new economy, we need a new vision of a good life, and, and it's all connected. So never can you look at one piece in isolation, you always have to look at it in the round. So it's necessary to change the productive model, no? Yeah, yes. and also not externalize the true cost of what it takes to live. Yes. We have to internalize this cost and learn to enjoy it, by the way. Because okay. actually, I agree with you about the dodgy carrots, but I, I do grow tomatoes on my roof in London, actually. Yeah. And they're, they're pretty good, and I don't use pesticides. But I know I agree with you. It's not about little hobbits all kind of having a little patch of land, <laughs> but it is about rehumanizing and revaluing the food system, which is a slightly different thing. And um, esta, esta pregunta is... This question is for both. Is it possible to design or to rethink cities from the need to feed citizens? And how would those cities look like? I don't talk about food because it's not my specialty, but there are other topics that, uh, such as air and vegetation. And yes, we have to rethink, redesign cities so as to improve the air quality and uh, so that there is more biophilia because this is a very important type of food. We need to redesign uh, cities in a small scale. I think the, what is wrong with the, uh, with the approach is the big scales. When you are planning for big scales, it never comes to be materialized. So you need to apply maybe a small surgery actions on the city so as to improve cities in the small scale. So you have to think about the neighborhood, how to improve traffic in a district, and you can do that with legislation. And you can do it if a government understands the need to do that. And there are very few governments which are willing to do that. I cannot talk about food, though. Uh, talking about food now, and talking about pandemic, 
Those countries with the highest obesity and diabetes rates were also the same countries who were the worst impacted by the pandemic. So from the entrepreneurial point of view, I mean policymakers, uh, could they somehow uh, pass legislation so as to improve health? I mean, could they perhaps make a change so as to m modify the, the predator model that we have with food and the production of what you call Frankenstein food, as you say in your book? So would it be possible for policymakers to, to force the change or to make uh, quick decisions? Politicians are terrified of food. Um, why are they terrified of food? Look at history. No. You know, basically any politician who took control and responsibility for feeding people normally ended up quite badly. And I, I just give you um, Louis XVI as my prime example. And of course, Louis XVI was a victim of geography because Paris was, a la was landlocked effectively. It didn't have access to the sea. It was very difficult to feed. The king had to take responsibility. Uh, he was called the baker of last resort. Uh, an Icelandic volcano went off. There was a series of bad harvests. People blamed the king. We know how it ends. So when, I mean, this is part of the problem, when industrialization came along, am I talking too fast, by the way? I don't know. I'm, I feel I'm just going to... Anyway, um, it sounds like that. <laughs> Spanish You're talking like about... Anyway, um, <laughs> You're talking sorry. about... <laughs> Um, no, but when industrialization came along, this is the reason why politicians were so happy to cede responsibility for feeding people to the food industries, because, you know, that the, was always their biggest and most horrible task, was, was feeding people. And of course, nobody likes being told what to eat. I mean, I was listening literally last night to an English uh, ex-minister talking about, you know, being asked, would you... Would you uh, be happy to tell people to eat less meat, you know, to put, or to have a meat tax? And she said, no, absolutely not. You know, I, I couldn't possibly, you know, sort of impose this kind of uh, restriction onto people. But of course, you know, the market does not create a good diet. The market creates actually effectively what we have at the moment, which is a lot of highly processed food, a lot of branded food, an incredibly consolidated food industry. I mean, if you, I don't know whether any of you know that amazing chart yes, that shows you know, every brand you've heard of, like kind of Coca-Cola or I don't know what the Spanish brands are, but you know, cornflakes or whatever it is, they're all you know, part of a bigger brand, part of a bigger brand, part, until there's only about nine companies that basically control the entire global food system. Now, what politician can stand in front of their electorate and say, I don't control the food system, you know, if I'm going to do anything, it's going to make the food more expensive, by the way, and, oh, oh by the way, don't eat meat. You know, no, nobody is going to want to go there. So we have a problem. We have a massive problem. Yes. I think the only way this is going to happen is if civil society decides, we decide, we demand that the gov our governments intervene in, in the so-called free market, again, in the previous panel, they pointed out the obvious point that there is no free market. Um, but also, you, it can't just be stick. It also has to be Juan's dodgy carrots. You know, there has to be pleasure in this as well. So this is why, um, you know, my thinking leads me naturally towards land reform, and it leads me naturally towards tax reform. You can't make food more expensive, which is what we actually need to do, and you can't break up the big food industries whose entire business model is predicated on trashing the planet um, without giving people something in return. And what I believe they need in return is access to land. You know, we need more farmers, not fewer farmers. Access to land, uh, access to shared spaces like community gardens, but at a bigger scale. So again, restoring. Um, this is coming closer to. Yeah. And by the way, thank you for the offer of a, a, a business partnership. Yeah. I mean, we'll have to talk later. <laughs> but anyway, um, you know, uh, bringing, as, as I say, giving people. Uh, you know, Amartya Sen, for, you know, he talks about sort of a good life being about agency, opportunity, you know, and, and if we're going to try and create a good life that is not predicated on just consumption and just throwing things away, but also pleasure and joy, then there is nothing more fundamental than making things. Miriam mentioned it in, in her, uh, you know, session yesterday. We can't just be consumers, we also have to be producers, we also have to be makers. And food is just, it's not the only 
subject, you're absolutely right, but it's, it's, it's just the yeah. most obvious one where we can get actively engaged. And as I say, we have to demand politicians get involved, but they won't do it unless we insist. You know, this, I think, needs to be some kind of a political movement from the ground. Perfecto. Ahora hay una pregunta que, que esta es... Bueno, there is a question which goes uh, particularly to Joan, who is uh, not a theoretician, but he's a great architect who has carried out huge projects. So there is a, an issue around food production in cities, which has to do with waste. I mean, f food waste in cities generate between 8 to 10 percent of uh, the greenhouse emissions. So according to the UN, according to the latest figures, between 25 and 30 percent of all the food in the world is wasted, thrown away. So this is also part of the urban agenda, how to recycle food. So, Joan, would it be possible to take into account the, the, the issue of recycling in cities? In Caroline's book, she talks about some sausages from Tottenham, right? Sausages that were made with the, with the waste from London food. So that was a way of closing the, the cycle, the cycle of food. So how to recycle food waste? Obviously, you cannot do that right now. But the question to Joan is, uh, how could we recycle food in cities? How how should we do it? Now, they are not thought, taking that into account. However, apart from uh, restoring the former Barcelona garbage tip, we also build the um, Xeleria in Catalan. I don't know what that is. A place where Okay, like a waste treatment plant in Barcelona. So we built it so as to be able to close down the garbage tip. And this uh, waste treatment plant had several levels. One of them was cremation, composting, uh, separation, drying, etc. So we built it with the thought that Barcelona is going to keep on growing. Barcelona is actually decreasing its number of inhabitants. But in a couple of years, the Barcelona po population was remaining stable. And then in 2008, the waste treatment plant decreased its activity. With the 2008 crisis, people started reusing stuff at home. They started uh, using their food better. And actually, the Barcelona waste production decreased almost half. So in the face of crisis, not in the pandemic, I do not mean in the pandemic, which was quite the opposite trend. Waste increased during the pandemic because consumption increased. So most people stayed home and were forced to cook. So we were using food better. So just with better education, just with better training, uh, knowing your own home economy better, you would reduce the amount of waste generated at home. So when we talk about waste, we have to consider individual waste, which is related to the person's education. So I think at schools, they should teach children how to recycle the things you you use at home, such as clothes, food, what we call um, well, devices, you know, the program obsolescence of devices, how to reuse and recycle devices. So I think this should be taught at school. And then regulations. 
In the end, regulations are necessary. The law has to be there. Uh, so uh, as citizens, they demand a lot from us. And even in the absence of legislation, usually we are willing to do that. Uh, for instance, when I, when I buy uh, whole milk, people look at me funny, like, how do you buy whole milk? It's not healthy. And nobody's forcing me to buy uh, skimmed milk. However, I choose to buy skimmed milk. So this is all about education. This is all about awareness. You and I were working with uh, Inditex, Sarah, right? No, I thought you were working for Sarah. Well, I work for Sarah, Inditex. So at the factory, they have a 2023 agenda so that everything that is manufactured has to be recycled. So if a manufacturer does that, they have to recycle everything. However, politicians are, do not have that agenda for the whole country, I mean. And then we were talking about uh, medical insurance. Medical insurance were uh, imposing the seat belts in cars, the helmets in motorcycles. Now medical insurance is pushing for uh, increasing the taxes on uh, sugary drinks. So sometimes medical insurances are lobbying for change. So maybe we could do that uh, in order to improve health. For instance, air is something that you cannot purchase, but city air, I mean, medical insurance should somehow force to control the air quality in cities because there are many fatalities from people who die from respiratory illnesses because of, you know, breathing uh, dirty air. So I think medical insurance could do that. And now continuing with, Sophia, with the topic of cities, uh, throughout the history of mankind, uh, human beings have tried to create ideal uh, utopic cities like uh, Thomas More with his uh, 54 city-states. And the different proposals which have been made throughout history have always failed, like Le Corbusier's radial city, uh, who wanted to include urban uh, gardens in the middle of the city that also failed. Gray also generated a project which was called Usonia, a, a utopic city where everybody should have, um, you know, like um, vegetable patches which were self-sufficient. So architects in that generation have tried many times, such as Lucio Costa, Niemeyer in Brazil, they have tried to come up with social, with, with, with ideal societies, even architects. So the question would be, can we still dream of that utopic society that is probably going to fail? just like Curling has said in the book, for instance. In the end, general utopia is useless. Utopia is useful as a philosophical strategy. So are we still allowed to keep on dreaming? Dreaming, um, dreaming is, is just, well, I dream for eight hours a night, by the way, on a good night. But um, it's, it's just part of who and what we are, you know, I mean, it, it's very interesting. Um, James Lovelock, who you've probably all heard of, who has kind of had a very interesting trajectory in his life as a scientist, but he talks about humans as the consciousness of the, of the earth, which I think is a very beautiful thing. So however badly we're doing, you know, we are still conscious and we can still dream and imagine. And I think this is just phenomenally important. You know, if we lose this, we lose everything. But by the way, the reason I invented this word Cytopia and I went Greek with it was precisely in order to, because, you know, by that time I had discovered that food shapes 
everything in our lives, our bodies, our minds. You know, by the time you're about 25, there is no atom in your body that you were born with. It's all made up of meals you've had. You know, so that's quite a kind of mind-boggling thought. You know, so our bodies, our minds, our landscapes, our cities, our economy, our politics, our climate, obviously, um, and, you know, the, the, basically our ability to exist on the planet. So I just thought, well, maybe if we see the world through the lens of food... This gives us an alternative to utopia, which, as you rightly say, the U in utopia, if you don't know this, it comes, it's a double derivation, it's like a joke word. It can either mean a good place, from the Greek EU, which means good, I don't know how to pronounce it, or OU, which means no. So it's a good place, but no place. So it's ideal and therefore cannot exist. And I remember being really depressed when I discovered this. Because I thought, well, you know, utopia is our greatest tradition of thinking in a multidisciplinary way about how we should live, about what is a good life, what is a good society. And it can't exist. This is terrible. Um, and that's why I invented the word utopia. Because I thought, well, actually, if we, if we value food and put it at the centre of our thinking and build our idea of a good life and society around it, we can actually get quite close to utopia. I mean, by the way, good Zootopias... I mean, by the way, Santiago is a good Zootopia. I mean, wow. You know, I've only been here for 24 hours, but I have eaten so well. You know, so it, it's a bit like that great quote from William Gibson, you know, the necromancer author, that the future is already here, it's just unevenly distributed. It's this same idea. You know, so I think if we... Again, going back to what was, John was saying earlier on, you know, that... If we don't try and have these grand visions, you know, and it's interesting that we're sitting in a building that's very much a grand vision, um, but, you know, whether or not it works in all its specifics is debatable, but, you know, I'm enjoying being here nevertheless. But, um, you know, if we focus on, as it were, the achievable things... You know, there's no reason why we can't have all, you know, a doctor and a, and a lawyer and a school and a market in city neighbourhoods and design it like this. There's no reason why we can't give people more access to gardens and land. It just takes vision and, and dreaming. I mean, dre dreaming and vision yes. are the same thing. Without okay. that, there is nothing. So, uh, yes, we have to keep dreaming, but we have to then see what's actually possible and, yes. and also really build on what's already happening. It's happening all over the world. Good stuff is happening all over the world. So there is a lot of hope. But I always say it's like a sort of um, ocean current. You know, the mainstream current is still with what I call the sort of the 20th century idea of a good life, which is consume, consume, consume. And then there's this countercurrent going the other way. And I'm interested in where those two currents meet and where there's turbulence, because that's where I think deep change can occur. And you, do you believe in ideal cities? Obviously, you don't come from the generation who dreamed in the 20th century. I think we are already in utopia. Not all of us. You, you both are in utopia, but not all of that. No, no, I mean rich white men. We are already in utopia. Some white rich ladies are also in utopia. Some uh, white middle class uh, ladies have also tried to uh, reach it. Uh, LGBTQ people are also fighting for it, but I think we're already in utopia. People can fly to the Maldives, so they, they can live in utopia, the white middle to uh, upper classes. The rest of us are still fighting for it. So those of us who believe we must live in better cities, we have to fight for it. Utopia is about getting down to work. It's not about designing a city. I mean, those of us who were communists when we were young, we know that God doesn't exist, but communism doesn't exist either. So we know that utopia is something that you have to work on. You need to get dirty uh, fighting for it. If you want a good neighborhood, and if I get a commission to build a new park, instead of, uh, you know, paving the park, I'm going to leave grass, and I'm going to put a drain so that the water goes down to the aquifer. I'm going to plant different tree species. I'm going to uh, make uh, insect hotels inside the neighborhood so that bees and butterflies fly in the neighborhood again. I want to have butterflies in my neighborhood. 
But that is utopia, isn't it? Eduardo Galeano was writing about the utopia is in the horizon, but as you walk towards it, the utopia walks away from you. So they said, so what's the use of moving to utopia? He said, well, the purpose is to walk, to keep walking. So architects like you can make fantastic projects or also theory about food to help us understand that food is, essen is essential to configure uh, human territories. That is something. That it, those are reasons for hope for those who are here today. The next block, also before the Q&A, I think we have uh, depleted ecosystems. We have destroyed ecosystem, which took, I mean, biodiversity, which took 4,000 years to get made. And this is the so-called Anthropocene. You know that scientists never agree, but some say that we have generated a new geological era, which is called Anthropocene. Do you agree with that? And also following the thread of the environment and uh, linking with the previous panel. Caroline, do you believe this is the Anthropocene and also Joanne? Undoubtedly, uh, yes. Okay. And I think actually the debate is pretty much over. I really want to bring back, uh, build on what Joanne just said about we in the white privileged West are already in utopia. I think it's a really, really, I'm so glad you said that. It's such an important point. Um, and I always talk about a good life from the Western point of view because that is my, that's what I, where I am and how I grew up and what I understand. But I try to do it in a global context because actually what's happening is the world is looking at what we had created in the 19th and 20th centuries and thinking this is a good life. You know, and again, it came up in the panel yesterday um, about you know, when we were talking about sort of technology and design and and the, the the value of culture and you know I talk about this a lot too when we have this idea of progress and a good life you know we have better technology which allows us to shall we say trash the planet more effectively um, and create more inequality and all the rest of it it's, it's very often the case that a we the externalities are not visible to us because they're in the global south, um, and we know this absolutely explicitly in terms of you know the Amazon being destroyed because actually they're growing soy to feed chickens that we eat unthinkingly for lunch. But on the other hand, you know uh, the good life that we believe we're leading is not a good life because a good life is only good if it if it doesn't have externalities, and our good life has appalling externalities. So actually, it's not a good life. It may appear to be, but it's like the, the, the front of the theatre facade, and we never see what's around behind. And another important point I want to make is that... Um, Basically, why I'm so, you know, pa the word passionate again, I wish there was another one. Anyway, why I'm so keen, it doesn't sound the same, to come up with a new idea of a good life that is a genuine, different idea of a good life, which, as I say, is about redistributing wealth and land. We cannot get away from these things. These are always the elephants in the room that nobody, certainly not politicians, is very keen to talk about. It's mostly between the global north and the global south, actually. You know, and, and what I really would love to think is that somebody, li you know, 15-year-old living in Africa now doesn't think the only way of leading a good life is going to the city, getting a job, getting rich, getting a car. You know, there's some other vision. And it is. I mean, I know it sounds, everyone says, oh, you want to go back to being medieval peasants or whatever it is. No. But I think we need to... Think of what a good life could look like. And by the way, I've, I'm slightly becoming an anarchist. I don't know what you think about this, but you know, I mean, the anarchist actually, I mean, who hated the capitalists as much as the communists did, um, at least, but um, they were suspicious of communism as well. But they had this vision of a good life, which is actually, instead of saying, you know, one person has to be a wealth creator and therefore, you know, in Adam Smith's factory, they have to just put heads on pins all day because that's creating wealth really efficiently. But am I having a good life? No. You know, or do we have this completely different conception, just step away from this ludicrous economy and move over here and say, how about if I grew my dodgy carrots in the morning, made a bit of furniture in the afternoon and maybe wrote some poetry in the evening? 
this is a good life. Okay, well, how can we design an economy that leads to that and not to this other thing? What is wealth? What is value? What is good? I'd like to answer. I don't know because I'm not a scientist. But you listen to people and just like uh, the previous panel said, this is the Anthropocene, I agree. Is that good or bad? It has um, pros and cons. I don't know what they are, but probably it has some um, advantages. I mean, if we can, I mean, if this generation is capable of reducing the footprint and work positively, that's not so bad. Uh, as long as we can work with nature to turn situations into positive, that's fine. For instance, in Brazil, when they get rid of that Bolsonaro guy, when the soy uh, farmers stop doing that, st stop growing soy there, we can reforest the Amazons because we know how to do it now. We have the knowledge. So just like we can destroy, we can also rebuild, reforest. So it's not so bad if we can reverse the situation, you mean? Yes, I mean, my partner knows more about that than me, but he says, we have done it wrong until now. And this is something that we should remember. I mean, the, the plan I drew last night is wrong. So today I'm going to start again. So the decision I made yesterday was the wrong one. Today I'll make the right decision. This is what we have to do. Yes, and if the climate is changing, we should change too. But we still don't know how the climate is going to change. Exactly, because scientists do not agree just what they said about the impact of climate change in Galicia that is not warming but cooling. Okay, so we're going to open the, the floor to the audience for some questions. We have two great thinkers in the panel. Uh, we have listened to some deep thoughts, and so time passed so quickly, Joan, Carolyn. So we're going to briefly open the floor to the audience. One question. Good afternoon. I want to address a question to both of you. Maybe it's a bit complex. Let's see if uh, maybe you, you can answer. So the first part has to do with a topic that we are dealing with in architecture in this decade, which is the feminist architecture and the uh, uh, gentle architecture for people with disabilities. And I think you mentioned that briefly, which is the fact that architecture and design should be kind to persons with diverse abilities or disabilities or those who have relatives who live with disabilities. We know that, you know, as architects, it's hard for them to, to go about their daily lives. And the second part of the question has to do with a topic that I'm sure Mrs. Tawas is also uh, familiar with, which is the depopulation in Galicia. So what do we do with those deserted villages? What can we do with those abandoned uh, small towns? In the 90s and in the 2000s, there were many plans to tackle that problem. So how do we transform those deserted villages in Galicia into something else? Thank you very much and congrats. Caroline, Joan, about uh, the so-called gentle architecture and disabilities. I don't know if you know that it's something that is a consequence of the Vietnam War. In, in the USA, uh, there are many vets after the Vietnam War that gave rise to passing laws about accessibility for people, for disabled veterans. And so uh, people with disabilities were receiving grants, etc. So uh, when there is a very sudden emergency, 
usually there are solutions that try to patch that problem. Uh, in Barcelona, for instance, there is an example of a girl who called her mom at 5 a.m. and she said, I have to go to the station. And she was raped in a dark alley in the middle of a park. So this is, you know, something that has to be corrected. We need more education. Uh, we need to improve the surveillance uh, of some places so that this uh, assault cannot happen again. In Barcelona, we have a protocol, IMSA, uh, which is a department belonging to the city council. We have a protocol so as to avoid, for instance, dark alleyways so that there are security cameras so that there's good lighting everywhere in the city so that there are open exits in all the parks, etc. So we need to correct that. We always uh, react to the situations because that's the way it, it goes. But I think that gradually people are becoming aware of those problems which are very serious. I mean, I could take your second question about these abandoned towns, which I find really, really fascinating. Um, I'm listening to myself. But I, um, I think something really interesting happened during lockdown. You know, people discovered they could work f from home, which meant work from anywhere. Um, and if we think about the old uh, division between city and country that so many utopian models were trying to address, uh, including Ebenezer Howard in his Garden City, who explicitly talks about um, what he calls the town-country magnet. And what he was talking about there, and it goes back to the duality I was talking about earlier on, that people live in cities because that's the only way they can be connected. You know, and, but, but they miss out on nature. And he wanted to find a way of bringing those two things together. Well, we've now discovered we can live in nature and still be a banker, a doctor, a lawyer, a journalist, or whatever. This, to me, is transformative. And I think we will see this. We will see, and by the way, I'm, I'm, I'm half thinking I might try and do something like this myself. Probably not, you know, buy an entire abandoned village, but, you know, move with a group of people to somewhere and actually just lead a life, you know, start a, start a community. It's much more possible now than it's ever been. And this goes back again to what I'm saying about what is a good life. And to bring it back to the subject of this panel, territory. Territory, what, what is our relationship with territory? Well, all the way through human history, it's been about living well in a place, you know, and it's actually that connection to land. And, and there are so many beautiful abandoned places because they did not conform to this old 20th century idea of a good life, which is all about, you know, kind of fast city action and, you know, yeah, yeah. Blah, blah. but now it's time for a new vision of a good life. And actually these places are perfect. So, you know, I, I'm predicting that we're going to see them being re-inhabited. By the way, I hope it's not just lawyers and doctors. I hope it's actually farmers as well. You know, because this is actually getting to be very possible economically, but also in terms of, you know, how we redistribute ourselves in the landscape. I, I, so I think it's a really interesting question. Let me add something to that. For instance, the size, I mean, I talk about Catalonia because I live there. I suppose in Galicia it's the same, but the size of uh, inhabited Towns usually decreases when there is no school. So when when the, the population decreases, the school disappears. I have friends of my age who have had uh, troubled kids. I mean, troubled kids because, you know, they're conflictive teenagers. So they move to small towns which have something that we call unitary school, which is an integrated school that brings together uh, the primary education and the secondary education. So those very small towns that have in the same classroom uh, kids aged from 6 to 14 years, those are very good schools and they provide a type of education which is very integrating and it generates a lot of empathy among the kids and they work better than 
giant schools that classify children into ages. So I would advocate for not making schools disappear. Rather, I would advocate for making more unitary schools in small towns because many parents have to move from villages because they have to drive their kids to high school, which is like 40 kilometers away. So I think we need to revise this strategy of schooling and school distribution. Um, we just have two minutes left, and you have talked about abandoned villages, which is a problem in, in Galicia. So uh, I think there is a relationship between the territory as a prey and the territory as a predator. So some territories function as predators, and they, they, they function like magnets. They attract people to them. So I think that is not desirable. I have a couple of minutes left. I think, uh, well, we are running out of time, I'm afraid. But I would like to uh, pose one question to each of you as a summary, or maybe as a, a short pitch, like, you know, in 140 <laughs> characters, maybe. Uh, uh, so, uh, could you like uh, tweet uh, a possible title for a philosophical strategy? So, is it possible from our field to propose a basic uh, guideline so as to build an ethical discourse for architecture so as to tackle the challenges that we have to tackle? Because otherwise, the only option that we have is to leave the Earth and fly out to Mars. I think that's maybe uh, somebody's idea about the future. Um, I'm sorry for the short time that we have, but Caroline Joan, what? It's at the nexus of our two most important sets of connections. It connects us to other humans, and it connects us to nature. So when we eat, we are literally eating the, the planet. So if we value this thing, and if we put it at the center of our thinking and we build a society in which everybody eats well, and that means eating well without externalities, eating food that actually, I often say, you know, in a bowl of soup is the whole universe, because it is. You know, it goes from the soup to the body, the home, society, city and country, nature and time. So if we treat that soup well, and we care about the people who made it, and we care about the landscapes where it came from, and we share it well, we can build a Zootopia that's very close to Utopia. Okay. This is a long tweet. This is a long tweet. Can we disagree? It's about 140 characters. Mine is very short. It's your own. Yes. But with more people, not with not just with architects, with more people, multidisciplinarity. Yes, I like that. I like that message because sometimes we are too self-centered, and we don't understand that this is such a complex mission that we have to. I mean, all of us had to get on board. So it was so good to have Caroline with me. Not, not me, she, she is the important one. So thanks to both. Thank you. Thank you. Gracias. Gracias, Joan. Thank you. Thanks to the audience and to the organizers. Thank you.